So about every 25 years or so, somebody asked me to come out and talk. <laughs> normally, normally I don't like to very much because you all frighten the hell out of me. <laughs> and, and it's not so much you as individuals, but what you do with some of the things that I've been involved in creating. <laughs> People say, gosh, you must be really proud that you invented the notebook computer. And when I think about the fact that people spend 30% of their day looking at pornography on it, <laughs> wasn't exactly what I had in mind when we invented it. <laughs> the other reason I don't come out and talk very much is because I'm a felon. And even my best friends, uh, one of whom is Rex Gale, who I went to college with, which is why I'm really here today, uh, I got to follow the band. So you see where I am in the sequence. Um, why, am I, why am I a felon? Uh, I have an Interpol number. My family refuses to travel with me because when I go through customs, I always get stopped for extra screening, which I appreciate ever so much. Um, it's because when I was working on the first computer that had a hard disk drive, I had a very young wife who I was trying to impress, so I took her to England over the 4th of July, and I was promptly arrested by Her Majesty's Customs because I didn't have a document called a Carnet for the prototype of the first portable computer that had a disk drive in it. We were actually designing this in England, I had a $40 million development contract in my pocket, and you can imagine how thrilled the Commerce Department was in England when they found out that the guy that had the contract was in jail in the Tower of London for four days over the 4th of July holiday. <laughs> so every time I go through England now, since I have an Interpol number, they always say, oh, Mr. Gintz, <laughs> so, so nice to see you. What are you smuggling today? <laughs> and so, being a felon uh, doesn't enable me to get out you know, and travel as much as maybe I would like to. But um, it's, it's interesting in the marketplace of ideas when you start talking about invention and you try to explain to people what you do every day, um, it's a challenge. You know, sort of like listening to the band. Where, where does music come from? Who, who makes that stuff up? And so I've spent the better part of the last 40 years being called by people that have asked me to think about their problem and to try to come up with a practical um, idea on how to go translate some vision they have of whatever it is that they want to make into something practical that you all can use. So for the past three or four years, um, I've been working on an idea about using something as simple as your breath to determine how hydrated you are. And the reason that that's an important problem to go solve is that if you have an elder relative and they forget to drink water, it's about a $10,000 trip to the hospital every time that they go um, on their path to suffering from congestive heart failure. Having been on Hilton Head for the past 30 years, um, I've enjoyed the fact that I'm also a volunteer as the voice of the Hilton Head Prep Fighting Dolphins, and I've been watching uh, people every Friday get cramps from heat, which is another symptom of having a hydration problem. And so the one idea that I took from watching all the presentations today is the idea that you have to remember something from this talk. So I'm going to give you a very simple thing to remember, and that is eight. Can everybody remember eight? What does eight stand for? You remember when we were kids, somebody said, you should drink eight glasses of water a day. And so being, you know, uh, an engineer, I keep asking myself, what is significant about eight? And I've read all the research, and what I found out was, it seems like a good idea. Is there any you know, actual you know, reality to why we should drink eight glasses of water? And so the other thing I want you to remember is, it seems like a good idea. 
So behind me is my graphic on what we all are. And what we mostly are is water. And whether you're talking about your, you know, your lungs or you're talking about um, virtually any other part of your anatomy, once the water drains out of you, there's not really very much left. So keeping yourself hydrated every day is really important. And the problem is, unlike your Chevy out there, you don't have a dipstick. So how do you know? if you are properly hydrated or not. And so I'm going to share with you some of the voodoo ways that we currently use to determine if people are hydrated or not. My personal favorite is color. OK? So I'm going to conduct a little experiment. And you shall go, ooh, when I get done with this. In almost every facility in the country, we have color charts where we compare the color of our urine to the chart. And we're supposed to be able to turn and determine how hydrated we are. <laughs> Thank God it's the tea. My second favorite way is the one that the NCAA uses now to determine if students can go out and exercise after lunch. So for kids that are just a moment, you have two people. You have a 95-pound gymnast and a 300-pound football tackle. The NCAA says that we're going to weigh everybody before they exercise, and then we're going to weigh them again after they exercise. And we're going to determine how much weight they've lost in between those two measurements. And when they replace, oh, I don't know, let's think of something arbitrary, like half of their weight, then they can go out this afternoon and work out again. So if you did the math on those two things, and you looked at the number of bottles of water that a 300-pound lineman would have to drink, you'd literally have to waterboard that 95-pound gymnast <laughs> for, for her to, to have the, the equivalent amount of water. So we have color, we have weight. What other kind of innovative ways can we figure out how to measure hydration? My third favorite one is blood. Every TV show that you watch, what happens? Fire department shows up and they immediately stick an IV in somebody's arm. How do we know that that works? Why do they do that? So if the answer is an eight, what's the answer? Well, it seems like a good idea. <laughs> but does it actually work? We don't know. So for the past three years, I've been thinking about how one actually determines if a person is properly hydrated. And if you stop and think about what we all have, lungs, and we inhale and exhale every day, we realize that the secret is there. And every time you exhale, you exhale about 300 gases. And many of those gases are in very minute parts, like parts per trillion. So how do I go measure something that's in parts per trillion? And the answer is, my friend, everybody knows what this is, right? Everybody's got one. Well, maybe not a Blackberry, but everybody has a cell phone. <laughs> this is. This is a microwave, OK? And so the way that we're going to do calculations is we're going to take the chips out of this and make some special chips that enable us to make a device called a microwave rotational spectrometer. But you can think about it as a cell phone, because what you're going to really care about is the results from the test are going to show up on your cell phone, and you go, oh, I'm about a quart low. So people always ask me what a device for measuring breath is going to look like. And we all do things that are analogous to things that we understand. So I brought my invention. And the invention is a device that I blow into. And it's going to have my 
Say it after me, microwave rotational spectrometer. Microwave ray rotational spectrometer. Stuck on the back of it, and look at the display and go, oh my god, I'm down a court. When is this going to occur? We're hoping in the next two to three years, because I'm not sure we can continue to rely on looking at the color of RP or um, giving people IVs that they may not need. Or, or last, you know, but not least, is my least favorite one. You've been a great audience. Thank you so much.